Welcome back. This is John Hoven with Dr. David Varan on the little deeper uh, dive in terms of uh, what Dr. Varan just outlined was uh, the best patients or the most engaging, uh, those that are participating in their care are those that are, I think, and Dr. Varan, I don't want to speak for you, but it's usually those cases that are not only the most fulfilling, but also have a better preponderance for potential positive outcomes. Absolutely. The, the more involved the patient is and the more responsibility they take for their health as well as keeping me on track, the, the better off it is. Um, I have to tell you kind of an interesting story where all this got started. Back when I was uh, in medical school or first year of residency, I can't remember when, uh, this was way before the internet and before uh, electronic medical records. I left the room, got called out of a room uh, with a patient uh, getting ready to start a visit and left the chart, a very thick chart on the table right there. And, and about 10 minutes later when I returned, uh, the chart had many pages turned over. And... Uh, and so I said, well, what's, what's all this? And he says, well, those are sheets of visit notes and, and uh, lab results that aren't me. And, and, and so it, the light bulb kind of went on in my head that the best people to curate a chart is the patient themselves. And so from that point on, I made it a point with my nurse that when a patient came into the room, Room, they were to go through their chart and make sure that everything was correct. And then I started putting a piece of paper down there for them to actually write their notes, and we would include that in the chart so that we had the patient's notes and my notes together. And it's a pretty radical idea back then, and I don't know if any faculty members picked up on that, but I found it to be immensely uh, refreshing and took a big load off my mind for having the patients involved in their care. Absolutely. The, um, th that process, uh, fast forward uh, to today, what are uh, some of the tools and technologies that, uh, and, and the methods that help facilitate that process the best in your practice? Yeah, there's no question the, the, the portal for patients who do not have access to the direct same tool that I'm using is important. Uh, one of the things that really uh, is... Uh, my um, uh, targets, if you will, is is our records are just replete with uh, garbage. Uh, unlike any other industry, medicine has never had a culture of accuracy or integrity uh, or fact checking um, because we don't. Nobody gets paid to validate whether uh, what a physician puts in the chart or what a patient says is true. And, uh, and so the analogy I always make is, would you ever go to a bank and uh, to withdraw some money and the teller would ask, well, how much is in your account? Well, that's exactly what we do in medicine. When a patient comes to see us, uh, we just blindly put down what they say is truth. And I'm a physician myself, and then when I went to be seen with a doctor, and I said, try to recall my medical history, I knew it was bogus because I couldn't remember when I had certain things, and I left out big things in my medical history that were important. And if I'm a physician and can't accurately and reliably recall my medical history, I, I just wonder how much of what is in our charts is accurate. So I really, really rely on, on, on the patients to validate that. And I've incorporated that into my face-to-face -face visits. So in my exam rooms, we have very large screens. And in some of them, I have two screens. One's a 42-inch screen. And the whole first part of the visit, we pull up the patient's charts and then go through and reconcile their problem list and reconcile their medicines before we ever get started, and then we set the agenda for the visit. Now, that takes about three or four minutes out of the visit, but that assures me that the patient and I agree that the 
that the data I have on them is accurate. And then, of course, I, I expect them to be logging in frequently uh, and making sure that uh, they review the lab results, they review the notes, and they attest to the fact that the note that I took of that visit or the note of that visit is an accurate one. Mm -hmm. And I ask them to be free to call, uh, to message me or to put in documents that are inaccurate upload pictures, and various things like that. Well, that is an awesome practice, Dr. Baran. Uh, how many other primary care physicians uh, do that 42-inch screen uh, review, do you think, in uh, your peers around the USA and the world? I, I don't think very many because the majority of them look at the computer not as something to facilitate a visit, but as a noxious intervention between them and the patient. And as a result, they use it that way and or don't use it. Whereas I've always looked at the electronic record and the computer as an integral part of the visit. And so in addition to the medical record, I, I routinely go to websites. I use uh, Zygote Body. I use all the resources that the patient has discovered and we incorporate those into the visit and spend as much time both looking and validating the information. Uh, I'm a primary care physician so I keep telling all my patients we know a little bit about a lot but not a lot about a little. And as a result I rely on them to go deep into their medical condition and their personalization and help me facilitate their health. And that's that's been my Modus die for a long period of time, but I don't think a lot of other uh, physicians adopt that attitude. They take the burden of, of medical decision making on themselves, and as a result, make life a little bit more difficult than what it really can be. Yeah. Wow. Well, that is absolutely uh, a best practice that I wish that my primary care physician followed, and I'll certainly uh, continue to encourage her, and uh, we'll work towards those goals because the. Um, Announcement uh, the week before last. I don't know if you followed uh, the NIH's uh, with Dr. Collins' acceptance of the Precision Medicine Initiative report. Well, I've kind of looked at that in the back of my mind and haven't paid too much uh, attention to it, especially over this last week and or the month preceding to it, because we've been moving our coding from the old ancient ICD-9 to ICD-10, so that's been a big issue for us and dominated our thinking. I, I'm a little bit. I wouldn't want to say confused, but uh, perplexed as to how we're really going to use precision medicine because of the convoluted nature of our medical system here. Uh, on a daily basis, an insurance provider or somebody who's the third party involved in the care uh, is actually inter interrupting any kind of personalization. So, for example, if I've, I and the patient figure out that one medication really does work best for this patient and they switch insurance plans and that medication isn't on the covered list or is a tier two or tier three, it's amazing how many times we have to disrupt the uh, the individualization of care in order to accommodate the payment. And I think this is going to go down in AIDS uh, when individualized or personalized medicine comes in, we may do genetic studies on an individual, we may find exactly what, what's necessary, but if the cost of that is going to be not covered by the insurances, we might as well not do it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's the uh, predicament that uh, personalized medicine or precision medicine faces right now is the whole reimbursement in the business model. Yeah. You had mentioned uh, ICD-10. Uh, how is that conversion going? I think that there was a uh, this month was one of the uh, hot months for the uh, conversion, correct? Well, on October 1st is when nationwide we had to convert, and so CMS um, uh, mandated that all claims be processed as of October 1 using ICD-10 rather than the old ICD-9. Uh, this whole business of nomenclature is, a, is an interesting one, and 
and there's a long history uh, in why we code things that is uh, confusing to most patients, and uh, but is necessary in order to process bills. And we're the last country in the world to actually go to ICD-10. In fact, uh, next year already some countries are going to be experimenting around with ICD-11, and mm -hmm. and the idea behind these coding systems is when we document a patient's condition, at some point we want to identify that patient's condition using a term, a, a word that describes it. And, and many of these infinite number of conditions, at some point in time, uh, an organization or an individual that wants to do studies has to take this stuff and then convert it into standardized language. Well, the coding that we use is that standardized language that allows uh, a state or a city or a county or a government to actually try to figure out the, the health status of the population. And so coding is necessary. But uh, we're the only, one of the few countries, if not the only country, that uses the coding for billing. Whereas most other countries use it for decision making and policy making, but not for billing. And as a result, we've had, we in the United States have had to take the coding system and modify it slightly so that we could use it to pay uh, for episodes of care. And the, ICD, the previous ICD-9 had about 19,000 terms and was already used up. So new diseases that were discovered could put into code using the old system. The ICD-10 system um, uh, moves that closer to 100,000 terms. It's actually 70 to 90,000 terms, depending on how you want to classify it. But even that's going to be shortcoming because especially as we get into genomics and things like that, we may find that every individual has a unique disease. And so most of us that want to code things actually prefer uh, a coding system called SNOMED. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and that was a, a system designed by physicians, pathologists in the UK and covers both animals and humans and has about 300,000 terms and over a million um, relational uh, and canonical uh, items. So things like chest pain can be categorized both as a GI tract, of chest pain, or cardiac, and it fits into a nice ontologic structure. And eventually, the ICD classification or international classification of diseases is going to migrate more and more towards where SNOMED is. But, but there's many, many different code sets around the world uh, that are being used. I had heard of SNOMED, but being a layperson, uh, I'm not familiar with the uh, oncological structure. Yeah. But uh, yeah. that's certainly good to hear um, primary care physicians such as you that are uh, watching and, and learning and moving in those fronts because that's ultimately what uh, what's going to reach parity. I mean, right now, what is it, the U.S.? You always see that wicked graph, the U.S. is number one in spending and number 47 in mortality and outcomes. Well, let's get the parity so that the art and science of medicine is in sync with the business of medicine. Absolutely. It's with, now that we're on ICD and then as the claims data starts to build, we'll be able to compare apples to apples a little bit better. But even there, there's a huge fundamental problem in 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 the payment system that actually uh, causes uh, data disruption. Uh, I'll give you a good example. If, if, uh, if I want to draw a complete blood count to find out whether you're anemic or not, a um, long time ago we would, we would be able to put down rule out anemia as the code to justify drawing the CBC. Well, now that went by the wayside uh, over a decade ago, and we were actually have to specify, well, what is the diagnosis that we're using to justify drawing 
something that will in order to get remunerated from it. So many people would put down anemia. Now, if the blood sample then showed that the hemoglobin count was normal and the person didn't have anemia, nobody goes back and then resubmits the claim saying that, the, the, that this person is normal. Because if they would do that, then they would have to pay back the money. Well, and yeah. so what happens is uh, the only way to rectify and, and make things accurate is to resubmit the claim with the proper diagnosis. And over the course of a person's lifetime, people will accumulate these claims with bogus diagnosis. In fact, I would think that up to 40 to 50 percent of all claims-based data is probably not factual. good example is me. Uh, I have emphysema. And the reason why I have emphysema is when I went to work for a previous employer, I grew up in and was treated for tuberculosis when I was 13. But whoever, and I was fully cured, I've run marathons and everything like that, and my pulmonary functions are entirely normal. But in order to do that chest x-ray, since I can't do the TB skin test anymore, I'll just be positive, uh, somebody uh, put down emphysema as the diagnosis for me to get that x-ray covered by the insurance. And so I spent maybe six hours uh, um, online with the Aetna, who was covering that uh, employee health program at that time. And finally, the agency said, well, we can't take your word for it. The only way this can be rectified is if the original person who ordered that resubmits a claim and puts the proper code in there. But even there, it's a little bit bogus because the, the, an x-ray cannot be taken for a normal person. You have to have a cough, you have to have some type of reason in order to pay for this. And so the way we pay for medicine just encourages and invites inaccuracy in the, in the, in the data that we have. That's amazing. And uh, the, the, the good news, bad news is, is that uh, you are not an outlier a data point of one in that type of scenario. No, no, I, I think um, just about anybody that goes to see a physician somewhere along the line, if they're not very, very attu uh, attuned to that record um, and help, help uh, clean up the record and keep it accurate, uh, is probably uh, their medical record is full of barnacles of inaccurate data that cause downstream medical decision making and will certainly influence precision medicine because they'll be looking at the chart and doing some artificial intelligence algorithms and stuff like that. And if, and if you're using algorithms and the algorithms are using inaccurate data in the chart to make decisions, I think it's just going to perpetuate the problem. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Dr. Moran, thank you so much for taking the time to meet with me this morning. Uh, I'm going to uh, put a link in uh, to, I think you have a website that then also lists a lot of your publications and the materials that you have uh, referenced, especially the practice, setting up a practice with review of screens and being able to do that. I think there's a lot of folks that would love to take that best practice to their primary care physicians. Sure. Be glad to. Excellent. Dr. Varan, thank you so much. This is John Hoban for the Society for Participatory Medicine. Thank you so much.